This is Walter Bosley, and welcome to the Walter Bosley Channel. A few years back, when I was working on Secret Missions 2, the lost expedition of Sir Richard Francis Burton, um, I was uh, at the same time stumbling upon finding some rather interesting information about another figure who fascinated me, uh, Ambrose Bierce, the American Civil War veteran and journalist who is well known to folks um, uh, in the literary world, but he's probably most famous for having disappeared in 1913 after riding on horseback across a bridge in El Paso, Texas into Mexico. His secretary received one letter from him and that was the last anyone heard or saw of Ambrose Bierce as far as we know publicly. Now my stumbling into this story of course led to my writing the Secret Missions 3 book um, about Ambrose Bierce and these questions about his disappearance and other questions that had popped up in my mind the closer I looked at his life. Found all sorts of interesting things which I've talked about and of course I've written about in uh, Secret Missions 3, Destination Carcosa. In that book, I reference and have since talked about, mentioned, really not much more than that, one of my resources. And I wanted to just talk a little bit, share a little bit of that with you now. I had seen... I honestly can't remember where now. I had seen a comment somewhere that this would have been in 2015, mid-2015. I'd seen a comment posted that Ambrose Bierce may have been involved with the Crystal Skull, the legendary Mitchell Hedges Crystal Skull. This intrigued me, of course, because I was aware, to an extent, uh, now I look back on it, it was a limited extent, uh, but I was aware that Ambrose Bierce was very much interested in strange things and the esoteric, and I found it really intriguing, the idea that Bierce would have had anything to do with the legendary Crystal Skull. So I decided to look into this a little bit deeper, and um, I found one, one single uh, internet hit on this book titled Ambrose Bierce, F.A. Mitchell Hedges, and the Crystal Skull by Sibley S. Morrill. Now at the time, as I said, this was the one single post that I found on this particular book. And I thought, oh, wow, okay, this really is an obscure source. And the, the brief mention that I had seen that led me to looking for this book had mentioned it was decades old. And I, of course, learned that it was published by Cadleon Press in 1972. Now, Cadleon Press um, had a P.O. box in San Francisco, California at the time of the printing of this book, but what really struck me at the time, and those of you who've read my books and have heard me talk about my books and my research, you know that I have um, an eye for synchronicity. Um, I'm a bit superstitious in how things have come to me. 
and uh, 2015 was merely a year after I had finished the third of the Empire of the Wheel books, so I was still... Oh, gosh. Um, I want to say experiencing, definitely, um, synchronicity, but um, in the throes of it, uh, influenced by it. Now, uh, this was, of course about six months, five or six months, I want to say, after I had had some very weird experiences in the autumn and Christmas season of 2014. So, when of all places, I saw that this one single listing of the existence of a copy of this book by Sibley Morrill about Ambrose Bierce, Mitchell Hedges and the Crystal Skull, published over 40 years ago. Well, 50 years ago now. Yeah, 1972. Wow, at the time it was not quite 50 years, of course. Uh, but that this one copy that I found listed on the internet was located in the library at the University of California in Riverside, which those of you familiar with me and my writings and such know that that's probably about without traffic, about maybe a 15 minute drive from my house. And I thought, wow, of all the places in the world for this one single copy that I could find to be found, so over there at the UCR library, which I've, you know, had gone to on previous occasions, uh, at the time, a good friend of mine was working there. She has since passed away, unfortunately, but she was working there at the time. And, uh, so I headed over to the library at UCR found the book on the shelf and, and discovered that it, it was a, a, a more of a pamphlet of a book, um, very inexpensively printed, um, less than a hundred pages, which includes the bibliography and title pages and everything, a very plain blue, um, uh, kind of heavy bond stock cover but not so heavy that it stays firm. And with just very plain, uh, what looks like uh, Times New Roman or, 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 you know, whatever the equivalent in 1972 would have been of, you know, the most basic font. And th there's no images. It's just the title of the book in capital letters and the author. And the an ISBN number and the price, which at that time you're going to love this. Um, the price in 1972 for this little book was three ninety five. And um, boy, have times changed, right? And on the back, you know, there's the usual blurb summary, and but that's really it. Very plain book, direct and to the point. So I sat down with my notepad and I went through it and for the first time uh, read Sibley Morrill's account and hypothesis of Ambrose Bierce and F.A. Mitchell Hedge's association to each other as well as their mutual association allegedly to the Crystal Skull. Now, in this book, Morrill flat out states that Mitchell Hedges and Beers were secret agents for their respective countries, Mitchell Hedges being British, Beers being American, and that they were both working as secret agents down in Mexico and had worked together. This is the basic premise of Morrill's little book here. So, I took my notes, 
and uh, it, it, the, the book, by the way, was in the reference section. It could not be checked out. So it wasn't quite in special collections, but it was definitely on the no checkout shelf. So that's why I had to take the best notes I could. And I figured, OK, I'll be back and um, I will uh, uh, just be back with with more pages and <laughs> a fresh pen to write down as much as I would need to and of course arm myself with plenty of quarters so that I could scan you know uh, particular pages that I wanted to and uh, you know off I went and then it was about I was already I, I was already into uh, I was committed to writing Secret Missions 3, Destination Carcosa, and I was into the early uh, research phase, okay, where I read a lot of books. And I had gone online and ordered a couple of biographies of Beers, and I had bought the complete works of Ambrose Beers. Um, I bought the ghost stories of Ambrose Beers, which is, is a pretty cool book. And then I uh, took a look just to see if I could find a copy of the Morill book for sale. And this time I did. And again, I found one copy available and I'm thinking I got it at Amazon I honestly at this moment I'd have to dig through documents records receipts and stuff but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I got it at Amazon one copy was available at the time that I did the search so I bought it and I will say that subsequent to my receiving my copy and writing my book on Ambrose Beers, other copies of this same book have appeared on the market. And, and you can see it for yourself, the, the plain blue cover. It, the, the one I have is identical to the one at the UCR library, except in one interesting way. You might say, those of you who are familiar with... Um, with the odd tale of Morris K. Jessup and more specifically Carlos Allende and the legendary Vero edition um, of the book about the Philadelphia experiment about that um, uh, or, or Jessup's book I'm sorry Jessup's book and uh, anyway, it's, it's embroiled in all that um, Philadelphia experiment stuff. I highly recommend that you check out um, the Saucer Life's podcast from Aaron Goulias about Morris K. Jessup and Carlos Allende. My point of bringing that up is to not get uh, sidetracked into the, the, the details about the Vero edition of the Jessup book and, and his Flying Saucer book and Carlos Allende and all that. The point is that the Vero edition is famously this annotated edition, which was suspected to have been passed around um, some very interesting, uh, between some very interesting uh, individuals involved with um, secret technology and naval intelligence and, and such. But um, the copy of the Sibley Morill book, which I received, buying it on Amazon, uh, completely unaware of anything in it, um, the copy I received is also somewhat heavily annotated for the first, oh, let's see, for about the first... 27 pages and at some point here on the screen if not right now but within a few moments or during the course of this uh, 
discussion, this audio, you'll see an image of what I mean, of just a couple of the pages, and that represents several pages. The person who had this book before me, and I don't know how long ago they had it, um, the best I can guess is maybe the last... I want to say the last 20 years by the nature of the pen that was used, but here's the problem. Those of you who, uh, uh, you know, are over a certain age as I am and uh, remember vividly the 1970s will remember that the felt tip pen uh, was released and became very popular back in the 70s. If you remember the one brand called El Marco, <laughs> Because it, it was, they had fine tip, they had marker brand or marker sized format, but they also had the fine tip. And there was, I think Papermate came out with a, a fine tip felt pen. And this is done in felt pen. Um, it does appear to have been annotated by one individual. It's all in... I want to say all in black, but I'm just double checking to see if I'm forgetting about because it's been a few years since I dove into this. But it's all black ink, looks like felt tip pen. So, you know, I would get, if I had to guess, I would say it's likely somebody in the last 20 years owned this book. But you never know. You never know. Um, let me uh, read the forward to you. You might find it interesting. And by the way, the forward, uh, that's where the, the annotations start. And this is Sibley Morel writing, of course. It is the thesis of this book that the mysterious disappearance in Mexico in 1913 of Major Ambrose Bierce, one of the most important and controversial figures in American literature, was vitally involved with the appearance in the 20th century of the extraordinary crystal skull in some way acquired by the late F.A. Mitchell Hedges, known primarily as a British explorer of Central America during the 20th, 20s and 30s. And that both men went into Mexico at the same time with General Pancho Villa's army, furthermore, as secret agents of their governments. While the evidence offered does not prove the ultimate fate of Beers, it does present a more rational explanation than has yet been given of Beers' actions in the months prior to his going to Mexico and the reasons for his going there. It also indicates that he almost certainly reached British Honduras by the summer or fall of 1914, finally disappearing in that general area and possibly in a section from which other and mysterious disappearances have occurred during this century, this century being the 20th, three of them being given. The nature of the evidence includes documentary material, most of which has been available for years, but which, so far as we can determine, has never before been assembled for publication, a matter which in itself forms something of a mystery, and for which the explanation suggested will not be popular in certain official circles. The first three chapters deal with the skull itself, they show its authenticity as one of the greatest jewels of the world, its importance in the Mayan head variant system of numeration, and its significance to the religion of the Maya as a sacred object. Though Beers is not mentioned in those chapters, their reading is essential toward understanding why it was that certain persons have suppressed knowledge of the skull including a glaring example from two major publishing houses, one British and the other American. 
in the publishing of Mitchell Hedges' autobiographical book. Their reading also serves to underline the need for Mitchell Hedges' consistent refusal to say how, when, or where he acquired the skull, and his negative testimony on his relationship to Bierce. The evidence that Bierce and Mitchell Hedges were secret agents in Mexico for intelligence purposes is given in chapters 4 through 7. It is our belief that the hypothesis to that effect forms the only sensible explanation for a chain of phenomena that is otherwise not explicable even by using the spavined workhorse of coincidence. That was the foreword by Sibley Morrill in which he lays out what his hypothesis is and kind of teases, um, you know, um, some other things, namely, you know, what, what, the, what the actual source and, and purpose of the skull may have been. But also, uh, Morrill clearly was um, one of the early critics of the um, long-running assumption that uh, Ambrose Bierce uh, just went off to be an old soldier in, in the Mexican Revolution and, you know, was shot in some village. Um, th there's many more reasons, much more evidence to doubt the um, popular conclusion than there has ever been to support it. The evidence that Beers was killed in Mexico um, and, you know, through some involvement with the uh, Mexican Civil War going on down there is virtually zero. But you have, you know, some places down there that uh, they figured it was good for tourism to claim that they were the village where Bierce was shot, and uh, some of them, one of them, maybe two, have put up plaques and, and, you know, kind of pushed that idea for a long time. I don't know if they do that so much anymore. But Bierce himself, and I talk about this in Secret Missions 3, Destination Carcosa, Bierce himself, in multiple personal letters and in two published interviews, openly stated that his intention was to go on into South America. Now, I point out the details of those letters and um, pretty much state my position that I believe he did go on to South America. He did not die in Mexico. I go into that in my book. Um, but here's Morrill. You know, here I was early in my research, and, you know, here, here's a researcher from now, 50 years ago, you know, presenting evidence that you know, Beers made it into Honduras. So I think it is certainly a reasonable speculation to continue going forward, suggesting that Beers did not die in Mexico as, as has been assumed that he went on and uh, went through Central America and down into South America. Now, on the issue of him being an agent, yes, this book was one of the sources that truly piqued my curiosity to look deeper into Bierce's professional life, and particularly his association uh, with the Department, United States Department of Treasury. Of course, in my book, I present the uh, historical documented facts and truth that Bierce was serving as an agent uh, for the Department of Treasury by the end of the Civil War, and he went back to work for them upon his arrival in San Francisco following the uh, interesting but, but ultimately canceled Hazen expedition across the Western Plains states of the United States, territories, I should say. He, the first place he went to to get a job was the Treasury Office 
there in San Francisco. And then subsequently, he got his first jobs uh, with newspapers and then on the magazines and such. And I, of course, through my analysis of his life after that, between, I think it was 1867, it was either late 1866 or early in 67, when he arrived in San Francisco for the first time, went back to work for the Treasury Department. I analyzed his life between 67 and 1913 when he disappeared. And it is my contention that Bierce indeed was um, an agent uh, for the U.S. government, specifically the, the U.S. Treasury. You have to remember there was no FBI in those days and the, and the Treasury Department. They were the game in town when it came to national security and federal agentry and things like that. So that it, it makes sense that that's who he was. The Secret Service, of course, is a part of the, the Treasury Department. Um, and it is possible that at some point Bierce could have been um, transferred over into the Secret Service after, um, uh, you know, a time in San Francisco as they expanded and needed more personnel. Um, Secret Service, of course, really formally stood up, I think, at the end of or right after um, the Civil War. It was, of course, founded upon uh, Alan Pinkerton's spy network that he had built for Abraham Lincoln during the war. And so I don't find it unreasonable when Sibley Morrill makes the claim after I dug into it and looked closely, particularly from my perspective with my personal experience in national security in the intel and counterintel world, I, I found that uh, Morrill's um, hypothesis that Bierce was a secret agent was not unreasonable at all. I'm personally convinced that Bierce was indeed that, and that uh, he would have been uh, um, serving such a purpose on that fateful or famous journey of his from which he did not return. Now people say, well, come on, Walter, this wasn't modern times, you know, and the man was 70 or 71, I think, when he rode into Mexico. You have to remember, as I talk about in the book, in my book, Ambrose Bierce, when you read any of the biographies about him, uh, he was in, you know, particularly for the era, he was in excellent physical condition and health. And, and it was noted, it was something that was noted that a man his age was still phys physically vibrant, healthy, alert. And um, so it's not too crazy to suggest that he might have been on some secret mission that was part of this this journey into Mexico and on into South America. But the man also, he was he was a bit depressed. He was he was suffering from um, he he wasn't happy that he was getting older because he was a vibrant, you know, active, healthy man, and he didn't like aging. Um, he was also depressed and 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 kind of well kind of down on his life uh, due to um, how his marriage had gone. Uh, basically, it's looked at now, in retrospect, that what caused the rift between Bierce and his wife really ultimately was a, was a misunderstanding. This is what the known facts suggest. Bierce got jealous because his wife was an attractive woman who, um, you know, she had potential suitors, and and you know how you know how that's done. Those potential suitors, they're gonna they're gonna throw the play. They don't care, and it wreaked havoc, you know, because Bierce. Um, now, when Bierce and his wife got married, when he and Molly got married, they were both. 
among the, they were a very popular couple. Ambrose Bierce, look at pictures of him. He was a good looking guy. I mean, even into his older years. Um, he was a good looking guy. And Molly was considered, you know, they're, they're, the one picture of her does not do her justice from what I understand from the research. Um, but um, I, I think, you know, when you take into account photography and lighting in those days and stuff, you could see that, you know, she was. But um, they were a popular couple publicly because they were, you know, young and good looking and they had, you know, the world ahead of them and ahead of them and such. But um, Bierce, his in laws, particularly his mother in law, <laughs> classic, right? would drive him nuts and, and, um, you know, just little things, the little normal things when you, you know, they're kind of forced to live around their in-laws. Um, and there was the, the it, for, for a variety of reasons, he and Molly, you know, there was some tension there and there was this uh, particular guy who just, uh, you know, my impression is he just wouldn't leave it alone and, you know, wrote her letters and such. And, and Bierce saw one of the letters. Now, as it turns out, Molly did not return this guy's affections. Okay. He, he, Bierce realized later that he misread the situation. Totally, totally miscalled it. But um, he had in his anger he had pushed for a divorce that as time went on he really didn't want it and molly didn't want it either but it it happened i guess they didn't i'm trying to remember because i wasn't writing a book about the guy's relationship with his wife i was writing a book about other things but um it it, it kind of it, it kind of um, uh, administratively, it just went on. It happened, and Bierce didn't do anything to stop it, even though he didn't really want it. Um, and it was really the tragic end, you could say, to their marriage and their relationship. And she died relatively young, not too long after. And that really, you know, kind of broke his heart. Um which is saying something for Bierce, because Bierce was, you know, kind of a tough on the outside, no bullshit kind of guy. And so this was the, the frame of mind he was in by the time he was 70 years old, 71. Um, so he certainly was physically fit enough. And he, and he, he was, you know, his son had died under tragic circumstances, his daughter, she was off with her own life, you know, and um, he was still mourning over his wife and, and the mistake he had made in getting the divorce. And he was just at a point in his life where, you know, if it was a situation where they had come to him and said, hey, we think that you, because you're a journalist, because you're older, we think that you would probably be able to operate um, unsuspected for us. And I could see Bierce in that frame of mind just jumping at it going, hell yeah, yeah. Because his own personal interests were he really did want to get into South America. He really was interested in uh, things like Morill claims he was, the Crystal Skull and things like this. Um, or perhaps it might even have been his idea. In other words, he might have volunteered, said, hey, give me something. Give me something I want, you know, give me a mission, give me a task. Give me, is there something I can do? Just I'm, basically, it's my impression, and I think the impression of others who look closely at it, that uh, Bierce wanted one last adventure, you know, or at least some ad big adventure, you know, before he breathed his last. So I cover all this and discuss all this in my book, Destination Carcosa. But there, there you go. Um, it makes sense. He had the, 
a professional connection to the Treasury Department. Um, I think they had sent him, given him other intelligence tasks at different points in his life. I talk about that in Destination Carcosum. Well, while he was in England and, and what, the, the touring he did around Europe, I think he was, I think he was collecting, as we say in the intel world. I think he was collecting while in England and doing other agenty type stuff. And, uh, and of course, this is while he was still relatively, you know, younger than when he disappeared. So it makes sense, really, that Bierce might indeed have gone into Mexico working as a secret agent. It makes sense to me, and I lay out why in greater detail in, in my book. But uh, um, what's really interesting about the Morrill book is what he reveals about F.A. Mitchell Hedges. Now, we've always heard the story that uh, Anna Mitchell Hedges, up until I, it, not too many years ago that she passed away, I want to say 10 years, if that long. Um, but, you know, she eventually went on the lecture circuit and, and um, was really popular in the New Age community because, you know, the whole thing about the Crystal Skulls had become a thing. You know, the, the psychic powers and, and uh, properties of gazing into the skull and such. And there's an excellent um, uh, bit of research done by a guy named Nick Nosarino. And you, you, David Childress and Stephen Meller, I believe, um, go into that in their book on the crystal skulls when they're talking specifically about the Mitchell Hedges skull. And, um, but, you know, Nick Nosarino found um, some interesting information that kind of enlightened him to, you know, what the truth may have been about the crystal skull. Um, it, it, it turns out that Anna's story wasn't true. But by golly, you know, she was having a lot of fun and, you know, it, it, it entertained a lot of people, but it, it turns out when you look closely that it wasn't true. And Sibley Morrill points this out 50 years ago. Okay. So let's go to, um, chapter four of the Morrill book and I'll read some pages for you. Now, again, this is. This is from the Sibley S. Morrill book, um, Ambrose Bierce, F.A. Mitchell Hedges, and the Crystal Skull, published in 1972. And by the way, it's no longer in print. It, this was the only edition published of this book. And when I tried to find Cadillac Press, they don't exist, um, that I could find. And, you know, they're certainly not at the P.O. Box address in San Francisco anymore. So... Um, I won't read the whole chapter. I'll just read a bit of it. Chapter 4. The way an ancient artifact arrives in the modern world is often open to doubt and usually brings controversy in its wake. But almost invariably, if the piece is considered to be of consequence, its arrival is accompanied by a measure of eclat, by a story that makes sense, at least upon the surface. In the case of the Mitchell Hedges skull and how it arrived in the modern world, the best that can be said is that it was sneaked in. This aspect is so pronounced that many persons have felt the skull was a hoax, something turned out by an obscure jeweler in Hoboken, say, on the order of an eccentric millionaire under the influence of the novels of P.G. Wodehouse. However, thanks to the MAN or MAN symposium of experts and the investigations of other qualified persons, there have long been, there has long been no question in informed circles of its being an authentic survival of another and long gone age. The major questions it now poses are how it made its appearance in the 20th century where and why its arrival was 
carefully wrapped in such obscurity and silence as to suggest it had been vitally involved in one of the more sensational or scandalous affairs of state. There are, of course, several stories as to how the crystal skull was found. None of them, however, are of any consequence, wholly aside from the fact that Mitchell Hedges himself always refused to reveal the answer. Some stories are that he found it in a Mayan temple on an island off the coast of Honduras. Others have it that the temple was on the Honduran mainland, or in Mexico, or British Honduras. And there are yet others that sound as if they originated in the mind of Edgar Rice Burroughs and have uh, about as much fact to support them as the story of Tarzan of the Apes. His adopted daughter, Anna Leguian Mitchell Hedges, present owner of the skull, has several times been reported as saying that she found it herself. According to one of these accounts, she discovered it on the site of the great Mayan city of Lubantun, when her father, Dr. Thomas Gann, and others were clearing it in 1927. The ancient city itself was discovered in 1924. And the story may well be correct, so far as it goes. The circumstances were these. She was 17 at the time. She was recovering from a severe attack of malaria, an illness that has a depressing effect. The jungle growth covering the site had just been burnt off. As she walked about, accompanied by other members of the party, she suddenly spotted the skull, clean of ash and dirt, sitting on some bare ground about as inconspicuous as an 11 pound, seven ounce diamond would be if seen lying on an otherwise barren mahogany table. The find naturally did much to raise her spirits, especially since it was her birthday. But what the report of it does to throw any light on the way in which Mitchell Hedges acquired it is absolutely nothing. From the story, one might deduce that Mitchell Hedges had found it earlier at the site and set it up on the ground for his daughter to find as a means of taking her mind off her troubles. But that doesn't make sense either, so far as where or when he found it are concerned. For if he had found it at the site, why would it be that neither Dr. Thomas Gann nor Lady Richmond Brown a close friend of the explorer, nor Captain T.A. Joyce of the British Museum, all of whom who were supposedly there, mentioned such a discovery. And of course, why also would Mitchell Hedges himself, who had at least a gifted amateur knowledge of publicity and how to get it, not have given the story of this discovery of such the, an object to the press at the earliest possible moment. Dr. Gann wrote extensively on the Lubenton expedition, and so likewise did Lady Richmond Brown. Captain Joyce, who later became president of the Royal Anthropological Institute, also had plenty to say about the expedition. But none of the three mentioned a word about the discovery of the skull or the skull itself. A silence clearly demonstrating that Mitchell Hedges would have had to bring the skull to the site with him and somehow persuade the others to keep quiet about it, if the account of his daughter's finding it were true. However, they knew the real story seems evident. However, that they knew the real story seems evident. Anna Mitchell Hedges has said that Captain Joyce knew the entire story about the skull, but refused to tell anyone. And quite likely, she was right. 
For Adrian Digby, one of the three participants in the Man article, and a colleague of Joyce, was quite unable to supply any information on the skull's history prior to January 1934. At that time, according to Digby, the skull was in the possession of Sidney Burney, the London art dealer who died on January 3, 1951, nine years to the day after the death of Captain Joyce. How Burney got possession of the skull, Digby said he didn't know, but Anna Mitchell Hedges vividly recalled that her father had left it with Burney as security for a loan to finance one of the expeditions. Bernie kept the skull until sometime in 1944 when Mitchell Hedges got it back on payment of 400 pounds. In the meantime, on October 15, 1943, Bernie had put the skull up for auction at Sotheby's, but bought it when he found the uh, canceled that when he found the other bids were too small to cover his debt. After Mitchell Hedges got the skull back, he kept it until he gave it to his daughter a few years before his death in 1959 at the age of 78, then as always refusing to say how or where he got the skull. Those are the points known for fact about the skull and how it appeared in the 20th century through the hands of Mitchell Hedges, and so far as we have been able to discover there is nothing else yet known that refers specifically to the skull and how or when it came into his possession that can be considered authentic. However, there are certain important facts about the explorer's life which, when related to what is known of the lives of others and the facts of the times in which they lived, have considerable bearing on this subject. In this connection, it is important to know that some high officials of the Mexican government are of the unofficial opinion that the skull was acquired by Mitchell Hedges in Mexico. And that it, like countless thousands of other artifacts, including an untold number in the 1960s, was illegally removed from the country. There is justification for their belief, quite aside from the indisputable point that the skull may have got into Aztec hands through the dissolution of the new Mayan Empire and the presence of Aztec and other Mexican forces in Yucatan at the time. Though that justification concerns some seemingly fantastic things, there is evidence to support it. The evidence involves one of the most unlikely combinations of people imaginable. They are J.W. Betamillion Gates, James Silver Fox Keen, Jules Beche, and J. Pierpont Morgan, among the Wall Street barons. Lord Duveen of Millbank, whose position in the art world must be described as unique. General Pancho Villa, the Mexican revolutionary, Major Ambrose Bierce, the famous writer, and various others, one of whom was Lieb Bronstein, later known as Leon Trotsky. How Gates, Keen, Bache, and Morgan got into the story was that when Mitchell Hedges first came to the United States in 1900, he had the right introduction and the ability to capitalize upon it. The ability lay in a certain savoir-faire, plus a market flair for poker. The details are given in his autobiography, Danger My Ally, published by Little Browning Company in 1955. Previously published by... Ellick Books in 1954. And they make sense as well as interesting reading. Suffice it to say for this purpose that on the first occasion he met members of the group, he vividly impressed them by winning 
$26,000 of their money. That was enough for them to keep their doors open for him. Subsequently, he did quite well in other respects than poker for a youth in his very early 20s, because as he wrote, I became a frequent visitor to J.P.'s magnificent house on Madison Avenue, as well as because of his famous associates, he managed to make enough money on the stock market to live a life of comparative or comparative leisure. The leisure plus his acquaintance with Duveen, to whom he was introduced by another friend, Bella da Costa Green, director of the Morgan Library, combined with assertedly long-established interest in ancient things, eventually led to his doing a tremendous amount of reading and a kind of making him increasingly dissatisfied with the course his life was taking. Hence, one day in 1905, when his capital totaled about $20,000, he decided to go to Honduras to see what he might find out for himself about the long-gone Indian civilization of Central America. But before he got started, fate intervened in the form of his mother's illness, and he returned to England. For reasons unnecessary to go into here, he presently went into an unnamed business in London. The business prospered so that he could afford a country house, a butler, etc. He married and settled down. Then in 1912, he learned, so his story goes, that some associates were trying to ruin him. So he promptly proceeded to ruin them, even though it meant ruining himself. He emerged from the dissolution of his firm with $2,000. Leaving his wife, Dolly, with $1,500 and a cottage in the country, he took off for New York with the remaining $500. His time with the intention of... This time with the intention of getting a job with some American firm in Mexico so that he might eventually begin his investigation of ancient American civilizations. In that part of his autobiography dealing with his return to New York, it is noteworthy that he says nothing to indicate he had any idea Mexico was already in the throes of its greatest revolution. I had no luck in getting a job with the American branch office in Mexico, he wrote. I answered scores of advertisements and pestered oil and shipping companies almost daily, but in vain. The observation is interesting, if only for the reason that the advertisements he answered could not, very many of them, have had to do with jobs in Mexico, things being as they were there. Presently, since he was running out of cash, the idea occurred to him of looking up some of his old and powerful contacts, so to speak. But he rejected it, he said, as likely to result in an almost certain rebuff. Finally, on the street one day, he met Duveen, who suggested that he get a job with Mike Myrowitz, a diamond merchant. He got the job immediately, even though he had no experience in that line. Myrowitz apparently was just waiting for him to come along. And he kept the job until that summer of 1913, when he suddenly told Myrowitz he was going to Mexico. There was still no reference in his work to the, Ameri to the Mexican Revolution, and he quit the job with Myrowitz. The day on which Mitchell Hedges left New York uh, move my marker, is the day on which Mitchell Hedges left New York is not known. But it definitely was well into the summer. As he described it, summer came and the air was fiery at Manhattan's concrete canyons. One day I awoke and knew I could wait no longer. It was time to go. The diamond merchant drove him to the station where 
He gave me a sheaf of dollars I wasn't entitled to, enough to take me as far as Florida or Louisiana. Not far enough, but yet I had to go. I had to get as near as I could to the land that was calling me, insistently calling me. And it was also very nearly the time for another visitor in New York that summer to leave for Mexico. That other visitor was the famous Major Ambrose Bierce, who for years had been one of the most feared and brilliant writers in the journalistic empire of William Randolph Hearst, and who also, aside from that, had won a unique and permanent place for himself in American letters. Bierce was intent on visiting Mexico and other parts of Latin America, with England as his final destination. He had been writing about his forthcoming journey for months to various people, including his New York publisher and later biographer Walter Neal. As Kerry McWilliams tells in his biography Ambrose Bierce, published in 1929, his letters from May 1913 through the summer reveal a definite determination to go into Mexico. Beers left New York in September and proceeded south in a leisurely manner, visiting some of the battlefields on which he had fought in the Civil War, so the biographers generally say. On October 24th, he was in New Orleans, where he spent a day or so seeing the city he had known so well in Reconstruction days. Though he was 71 and suffered an attack of asthma there, his health was basically good, so much so, according to biographers, that by October 27th, he was dining in San Antonio, Texas with old army friends. And by a curious coincidence, at about the same time Bierce was in New Orleans, Mitchell Hedges was there too, serving as a waiter. I'll stop the reading right there, because, as the listener will note, here we had Mitchell Hedges in New York, in the summer of 1913, at the same time, Ambrose Bierce is there. Now, yes, New York is a huge city, and you could probably point to uh, 20 other, you know, now well-known, you know, famous people that would have been in New York at the same time. But you see, that's a sleight of hand. What we're looking at here is a subsequent connection that is put forth and hypothesized uh, between Bierce and Hedges um, as secret agents for their respective countries. So, golly, they both happened to be in New York that summer of 1913, and they both happened to end up in New Orleans later on that year, that summer. And... They both end up in Mexico at the same time? Well, just being in New York, if there had just been that, yeah, you could say, okay, you know, that's nothing. But when you've got three points there of connection to point to, and, and, and I admit, being both being in Mexico at the same time as both being in New York at the same time are equally um, thin by themselves. Um, but it, it could look, I'm not going to say it does look like, you know, that's the conclusion we can draw. What I'm telling you is, from my perspective, and obviously from Sibley Morill's perspective 50 years ago, uh, it's certainly reasonable and looks like that perhaps Bierce and Hedges could indeed have either met, been introduced by their respective spy masters or whoever, their contacts, could have been introduced in New York, could have met up again 
in New Orleans um, for any, you know, kind of a uh, last minute, you know, uh, ops meeting, as we call it, before both of them go into Mexico. So, as you can see, just from what little that I've shared in the Sibley Mar from the Sibley Morel book, there's, look, there's just as much legitimate data here to hypothesize that um, Bierce and Mitchell Hedges were indeed spies and, and were involved with the Crystal Skull. Um, there's just as much data to support that. Uh, in fact, more data to support that than there is that they fought with Pancho Villa's army and got shot during the war and, you know, buried in an unmarked... It, it, you see my point? Um, so, this is why I continue with my hypotheses and speculations. And um, uh, I will likely, in a future... Uh, discussion on this future episode on this I will go into the annotated notes um, you know you open up the cover and um, there's a whole page of these notes and um, the person making the notes appears to have had um, a pretty good knowledge of the history of ancient cultures and their numerical systems and their mathematics uh, and also seems to be versed whether that's merely academically or whether that's because uh, they're into it, um, that also seems to be versed in, you know, um, some, uh, I guess you'd call it new age terminology or whatever, but I don't want to mischaracterize the annotations. I don't get the impression that the person who made these annotations is... Um, just doing this from the perspective of a, being some kind of new age enthusiast. This is somebody who has analyzed the writing of this book. I mean, I'm looking at one particular chapter in which, uh, you know, half the pages of the chapter are just, uh, just really heavily annotated i mean down to what you know what did Muriel mean by this sentence um and phrase and it would be really fun to think that the person who annotated this might have known something about this but you you, you can't really jump to that kind of conclusion you shouldn't jump to that kind of conclusion and it, you know when you get done you know, when you read all these annotations, you can, in all fairness, you can't jump to that conclusion that they necessarily knew something. But um, whoever did this, whoever annotated this copy I have, they were very much interested in, in the, this book. Um, the annotations are mostly, of course, uh, referring to the chapters on the skull. But um, it's very interesting. It's one of my prize uh, volumes, uh, research volumes in my personal library. And you can find this book now. You got, some of you probably already have as you're listening to this. Um, it's interesting how copies of this thing turned up, um, you know, after I had found my copy. After, like I said, the one listed was at a library 15 minutes a university library 15 minutes from my house i mean what are the odds and then um the next time i went online to buy one you know i i found i i think i'm pretty sure i just found one listing this one i bought 
and then it was shortly after that that another one was listed or maybe there were the two and the one I bought is the one that was annotated so um, you know it makes for some interesting thinking but anyway um, I wanted to share a little more in depth one of the sources of my book Secret Missions 3 Destination Carcosa and if you haven't read the book please give it a chance check it out I, I think uh, if you've read the other Secret Missions books or even just one of them I think you'll find well I think you'll find the whole series to be of your interest if you like the one that you might have read but um, you know definitely check out Destination Carcosa but uh, if you can get your hands on Ambrose Beers F.A. Mitchell Hedges and the Crystal Skull by Sibley S. Morill I think you'll find it to be really really interesting reading so anyway thanks for spending a little over an hour with me and I hope you uh, enjoyed this information and I look forward to um, doing another one of these audio episodes for you. So uh, we'll see you next time.